It's Friday, and I'm back with the next in our Fanzine Friday series. Today we're taking a look at Miser's Horde number no. 7 from 1984. Please stick around. I'm AZ Mountaineer, and this is our channel, Old School Rules, where we celebrate the community of old school gamers and grognards who like classic RPGs, miniatures, magazines, and everything that goes with it. Each week on the Fanzine Friday series, I take a fanzine from my collection off the shelf for a closer look. Today it's Miser's Horde number no. 7. Hope you enjoy the video. This week we continue our look at the fanzines put out from the United Kingdom called Miser's Horde. John McCallan and a various cast of characters are responsible for this one, but John's the common thread. Uh, we have one more to go, which is number eight, which is the last one in this series. And uh, we'll, we'll talk here in a minute about some of the transition we see. So this is the cover art. It's done by someone new named Tim Pollard. I think he did some of the art in the last Miser's Horde as well. This scene is sort of a woman. She looks like maybe she uh, has an Egyptian flair to her. She's in some trees. I see uh, spider webs, snakes. The arms of the trees kind of have like hooked little hands on there. And then there's some kind of bird beast that's uh, shackled on the right-hand side of the page. Here's our contents. And so we have the editorial. Um, and in the editorial, they talk about the fact that uh, this is that the next issue will be John's last. And he said that Brian, Ian, Richard, others are taking over. And he says sort of uh, interestingly, so if there isn't a Miser's Horde number nine, you now know who to blame. Well, we know who to blame because Miser's Horde number nine never came out. Uh, he talks about some other things. He this is often the case, right? So his interests have evolved. John wants to become more active and focused on the postal campaign he's been running and let other people sort of carry on with the fanzine. And just so often, right, what we see is the short run that occurs here because the original person either gives up and that's the end or they try to hand it off and then they, other people don't really have the, the, the pull or the drive to, to keep it going. DMing Wars, uh, we'll cover pretty much everything else in the table of contents. Uh, about w literally having a war like combat in your fantasy role playing game. Doug's Corner experience level discussion, Jerush Windwalker role playing game scenario, Men of the Cloth, and other things discussing uh, some of the different elevations as people move up in their careers in fantasy role playing. Open Forum, which is discussion of uh, the letters as well as some talk about some of the fanzines. Stra I don't even know how to say this one. Some st Stravag. Straviagans. Uh, that's an article about Traveler. Uh, in the Navy, which is an idea for some new or, uh, sort of original careers for RuneQuest. Uh, the first recorded tale of Quindron, the lore master, is just a fantasy fiction short story in the paraphernalia, which is sort of like that back page that we've been seeing. A number of people contribute um, this time around, and I'm if I get myself out of the way, you'll be able to see all those names. Um, John McCown and his brother Ian, of course, Brian, Richard, John Watkins uh, have been here for quite some time. Uh, Doug Cowie, Deb Elric are new. Tim Pollard is, uh, there, these others are art, art folks. Uh, Hudson Shaw, and you may remember Hudson from some of the other fanzines that we've looked at before. Phil Tor Torici, uh, Megan Evans, and just Fox. Uh, so whoever that is. And speaking of the quality and the amount of uh, art we have here, some of it's quite good. And so I think at the end of this video, once we talk about the fanzine, if you want to stick around, I'm going to show you some closer images of a lot of the art that's in here. I find Hudson Shaw to be quite good. I like um, his art a lot. And then I think Fox, um, I think that's who's done some of the other art in here that I like quite a bit as well. So we'll take a look at that, you know, towards the end. So DMing wars, is it such a battle? The short of this is an article for Dungeon Masters about how do you run or like a really big mass battle. So as I was saying, it's not, it's not clear whether you would stick the character into the combat or you would just let the players for a change of pace sort of um, take the leadership of the mass combat. I make some common things he points out. Obviously you can't go and roll every single individual goblin or foot soldier or whatever in there. And so you gotta figure out how to deal with that. Um, he says, obviously, we're not going to do initiative. We're just going to figure out what each side is doing and then resolve, uh, have a way to resolve combat. Um, same thing with the hits. We can't roll for everybody to hit, so we have to do sort of group things. And he has this concept of using dice, and both sides that are facing off would roll dice, and then you would figure out how many people died basically on each side during a certain time period of combat. Um, 
has a thought if you're going to have individual powerful characters obviously then you do do with deal with them separately so you have to sort of figure out whether they're going to wade in and fight against you know 20 orcs at one time or how you want to address them and then finally he says you got to give some thought to um, to magic because obviously even low level spells could be pretty effective on the battlefield he said but you know in his idea the mage is going to be someone that's very obvious you see the you know you see the hand casting or maybe the fact they're not the only people standing around not wearing armor and said you know if, if that happened on a battlefield then like a thousand archers turn their arrows and shoot at that wizard right because they know uh, presumptively they know enough that if they can hit the wizard they can disrupt spell casting and keep him either kill him or her easily because of low hit points or just disrupt spells so the spells can't go off and of course the other thing you think about in to try to get some realism here is thinking about terrain the effects of hills visibility um, you know concealment inside of trees in a forest uh, etc and uh, but in the end he encourages you to think through those things and try out an evening's campaign where a mass combat would occur. A couple points of news, they just stuck here at the bottom of a page. Um, one of those is something called Daemon Spawn, and it is a um, role-playing adventure. And I did a little bit of looking for that. I could find one uh, mention of that on the internet, and I've never seen, I've never seen this before. I've never um, uh, heard of anybody who owned it, but I'm gonna to try to hopefully find some other collectors who maybe have a copy of this really old game. It would have come out obviously in 1984. And you know, I, I checked to confirm based on what I found, it did seem like it did actually get produced. It's by someone named Rod um, Stevenson. I think Mythic Arts Publications is maybe the name of the publishing company that put it out. Then some conventions, uh, FantasyCon, Albacon, and Unicon are coming out in um, September, July and August, respectively. Okay, our next article, Doug Cowie, it's called Doug's Corner, and it's just um, some thoughts on new products. The first one is Caverns of the Dead, Dungeon Planner Set 1 by Games Workshop. Uh, he was a little critical of this. He kind of said, look, this um, beautiful box, great color, everything about it is sort of shiny and attractive, but not all that great and kind of expensive. And um, so more the product of marketers, he said, that he thought than gamers. That's his criticism. Um, other things that might be worth more worth your money, TSR had released AC2, the combat screen, and a, min a miniature adventure. He said the miniature adventure he thought was really good. The screen was okay. Um, but it, the adventure probably makes it worth it. He likes Avalon Hill's new Powers and Perils. And uh, says there's another game called Privateers and Gentlemen with a lot of rules and probably not as much fun to play. Um, another thing he talks about, Steve Jackson, Games Workshop, got married. He makes a couple of jokes about him and, and uh, the unfortunate lady who, who, who married him. Um, and then he asks whether, you know, rhetorically, do, do, do any people who read Miser's Horde use miniature, um, mi miniatures in their games? And talks about how good Citadel's uh, range is and he kind of considers them the dominant player in the market there in the United Kingdom. Also, Asgard, you know, hasn't really recovered. Brian Ansel, you may remember, left Asgard and went to Citadel. And sort of gives a shout out to Grindir models, um, who obviously produced a lot of miniatures over in the United States. Okay. He also mentions the rumor that the um, Games Workshop fighting fantasy books were actually an idea stolen from Endless Quest books by TSR, but that they got theirs to market first, and therefore they look like the people who you know took the lead on, on that idea. Finally, uh, issue three of Tortured Souls, that's the full-sized, uh, we'll call it a magazine, that had adventures in it. And again, every time they write about this, they just praise, praise it, how awesome it is, how well done it is, and, and, and in particular, what a fantastic bargain it is. I think it's only like $1.95, and you get four adventures. So it's by far the best value for money of anything you're going to get. And then, a sad note here at the end, they say, hey, we've just heard uh, about 50 people from TSR were let go uh, recently. And so, you know, sort of saying we don't know w what that means for the future of, of TSR and um, Dungeons and Dragons. Okay, so here's an interesting article called Experience Levels, Who Needs Them? And th the, the author's idea is essentially 
you know, this I, the, the fundamental idea that you gain experience points and you move up in levels um, is something that should be reconsidered. He's pointed a couple of ideas there, principally one, the fact that you sort of becomes a focus of what you do, right, is to go out and gain experience so you can gain levels and improve your skills. And he said, you'd be better off just role playing your character without this uh, focus on sort of success as defined by gaining experience points and levels. And the other thing he sort of says is, you should figure out who this character is in terms of, I guess you'd say the equivalent of uh, hit points and spell powers or whatever it is. And then it should basically remain static every single time you play the game. And he said that way, you, you know, it's not like, well, you have a second level magic user, I have a 20th level magic user. You know, there's no comparison between us. Um, I can go on adventures that you can't go on, etc. I don't really understand his idea, which is obviously as you gain levels in traditional game like Dungeons and Dragons, something that was a really scary opponent at second level, at 10th level is, you know, a walk in the park, which is certainly true. But if you had his concept that level, you never gain levels, you never gain more hit points, and you never improved your skill set, then, you know, two years later, you'd be running away from all the same monsters. And maybe that is the idea that you're always running away from dragons. You never get confident enough to try and take on a dragon. Um, and maybe you're supposed to overcome even an ogre, for example, right? Uh, through other means than just combat prowess. I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure about that. I thought it was an interesting article to read and to think about. Um, I'm not persuaded. And I think he says, like, well, it's, it's a cr contrarian idea. And uh, nobody in his home campaign was interested in it, but he thought it was worth the time to write out the article and, and, and suggest to people that maybe you should think about it. Here's a RuneQuest adventure. I like it quite a bit. This is Jerush Windwalker, that's what it's called. And so here's your um, background. Silverholm is a small town in Northeast Glorantha, um, east of Paringstone. It's on the west bank of a river cradles. It was an important stop on a trade route, but now it is not. So it's sort of a forgotten town and it's way past its prime. You've been, you know, so always, you've been called there by a town leader to come. A wealthy family came recently, said they were going up into the mountains to find the tomb of their relative Jerush, the Windwalker. They were warned it wasn't, you know, it wasn't all that safe that they should have more people with them. I think they had like eight men at arms and they said, you need even more to go up there. And they didn't listen, off they went. You know, a few days later, one member of the band comes back. He's got a broken arm. He's been, you know, almost beaten to death or and starved to death and all that kind of stuff. And he tells the story that he and his sister survived. His sister has been captured and he, you know, he obviously lacks the ability to rescue her. So there's an interesting thing here. This um, sort of town uh, elder has some knowledge and you basically get a, a die roll to, to see what information it's not clear whether it's it, you're going to get everything this person knows but we just randomly determine what the person knows or we determine how much of what he knows he's going to be willing to tell you but so spoiler alert he'll tell you if you, he'll give you a map show you where the tomb is um depending on how well you roll but the ultimate uh, truth here is that one jerush windwalker was a very powerful person with some connection to elemental powers he was a rune master once upon a time and that there's a group of creatures that have moved into the area called um, Torgrim or Trollgrim and they're half ogre, half trollkin. So half troll, half ogre for Dungeons and Dragons. And, um, and that's the deal. There's this small area of tombs. There's this band of, um, you know, these trollkin that have, trollkin ogre half breeds that have moved in there and you go up and try and defeat them and clear them out. It's an excellent, you know, very uh, typical idea the rescue mission, she is still alive if you can get there in time. And it's it's a one session at the most uh, evening adventure to, to and easily modified, right, to Dungeons and Dragons, any edition or whatever other fantasy role playing game you might want to do. So I thought, in, you know, especially in that sense, it's just it's a great little type of thing to stick in a fancy. It's a one 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 evening thing to try. So this article, Men of the Cloth, is um, Took a little while it's four pages as you can see it is kind of interesting it starts off so here's the question when does a bishop equal a canon uh, there's a good joke for your next DD game in there right and he says when you convert a six level original DD person to the new a DD. and he points out how some of the names were changed 
and in particular, the title Bishop went away. This, I thought, it just caught my mind sitting here in 2024. Well, he, he says, what is less well known is that the clerical level titles in OD&D, parentheses, hey, I just came up with a new acronym for original D&D. Maybe he did. I don't know when the term OD&D first started being used. Um, you know, and, he goes to, and he goes through some of the changes that were made from OD&D clerics to AD&D clerics and points out that very much in, in his view, the original OD&D cleric was a sort of Catholic warrior type. And that the titles they used all seem to have some connection back to the titles that were used in the Catholic Church. Um, he points out some interesting things about that. For example, they don't necessarily line up like, you know, a bishop is maybe whatever that is, a sixth level. You know, that's a pretty high rank in the Catholic Church. And um, the ordering doesn't seem to make sense. And the other thing that he takes issue with is um, someone sort of the administrative moving up that happens in real life in the Catholic Church. He says, you know, that's not the guy who went out and was a warrior, right? That is someone who was maybe a bit of a student, a bit of a politician. And he, so he points out that so there in the church hierarchy, someone could be very, quote, important who never really gained any experience levels because they didn't go out and adventure. So you could have a zero first level cleric um, in charge of and, and sort of able to give orders to a ninth level adventuring cleric, something like that. Um, I thought the concepts were interesting. Obviously, I don't know that I really thought too much about that, but it was an interesting idea, if nothing else, in your home campaign to ask yourself within the overall church structure for whatever religion your clerics are in, you know, who are the top people? Were they by nature had to have been adventurers? Were there other ways they could gain a lot of experience points and, and be a quote higher level and therefore have access to higher spells? How does that work? Um, he had an interesting idea about at some level you know, maybe you really can't get any dispensation, i.e. gain a level unless you get the blessing of someone higher level in your church. And maybe that becomes some of a quest. You've got to go find a big enough city to find a high enough level cleric to learn new spells, new abilities, or just basically to gain a level. Um, so that's an interesting uh, idea. He also had the idea of giving um, certain base skills to you as you gained levels. Uh, within the more so like within the church than the adventuring experience points levels and so he's sort of blending those two concepts of purely like a, an adventuring game which is D&D &D, with the real world but again I think these kind of things that if nothing else are interesting articles to read and to think about and then and I thought this very much he goes on a tangent says if, if you think the, the naming issues with clerics are bad you should go look at the magic users because not only are they not necessarily names that make you feel like it's a more powerful magic user, he's actually naming different types of magic or magic use, right? Um, you've got warlocks, sorcerers, enchanters, um, thaumaturgians, conjurers, evokers, and especially by the time you get even AD&D &D and then certainly second, I mean, you can actually specialize in different things like that. And so he said, like, these names really don't make any sense at all. Not that he's necessarily saying here's a better, so he doesn't have an alternative set to, to suggest, but he just says the naming conventions don't really necessarily make a lot of sense. So that's his article. It's a good one. Here's our open forum. We're gonna talk about some letters. Basically, some people like it, some people don't. I think that's the, the, the really, really high level summary of the feedback they're getting from people. Um, I think people, you know, here's a letter, someone who really liked it, said it's a good thing they have it in the hobby. Um, Another person writes in on this article, A Question of Magic, and um, it says it's very seriously taken in the novels, but you know, you really do need to think through whether you want magic in your campaign to be something dark and evil, which it certainly is not normally drafted that way in the rules, but it could be an interesting way to create a new campaign um, world or theme. But um, says, you know, I don't know that you necessarily need to think of it that way, and you certainly don't need to look at the real world and let that instruct how you run your fantasy role-playing game, right? Um, some people like paraphernalia. One guy had a real jab about it and said, I don't like it. It looks too American, uh, whatever that means. And, uh, and so he was not, he was not a fan. And then, uh, some folks wrote in on the combat mechanics game. And, you know, I talked about those articles a little bit in the last couple of issues and, and clearly not everyone was into the complexity of that, but some people said they thought, you know, he had interesting, um, interesting ideas. So the other thing I want to talk about here are um, our zines, zines. And um, 
So the other thing I want to talk about here are the fanzines. And someone had written in here and said, um, it's too bad we've seen the recent collapse of a number. Worms, Claw, Dragon Lords, Quasars, and Quasars have all folded recently. Not much is left. And sort of saying to Miser's Horde, you know, you guys really need to keep it going. They point out that we still have um, Sewers, the Journal of Senseless uh, Carnage Society, Demon's Draw, uh, Runestone, Drunken Disorderly, and a new one called Shadowfire. Pretty sure I have at least some of all of those, all of some of those. Uh, and then there's this great ad here. I have a new computer game for you, for your Dragon 32 home computer. This role-playing game uses all of your 32K. And I was trying to explain to my son uh, the other evening after I read this, trying to explain exactly how small an amount of uh, me memory or horsepower that is for a computer compared to the computer that he built for himself this summer. And it's like, you know, it's... I said, I don't know if that could have been only text. If it wasn't text, it would have been like just you know straight lines or stick lines drawn on a on a computer screen. I said, that it's hard to imagine how excited we were for those games back in the day, uh, and compared to what it would be like to, uh, to 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 try and play those now. Here's the Traveler article by Dave Elric, uh, and he's just got some ideas for his Traveler campaign campaign and a little bit of a suggestion for a. Uh, for a scenario. This is the RuneQuest sort of backstory or early campaign or um, I think I think you typically had a career before you start playing in, in RuneQuest. So this is more of a, he, he says, the Earl Flynn swashbuckler idea and he gives you the background. So basically a mercenary but with a twist, right? So your skills are basically climbing, jumping, swimming, and spotting hidden things and he tells you how to roll that and how to sort of set up your uh, character if that was going to be your your original career. Here is our one-page piece of fiction, the first recorded tale of Quindron Loremaster. This is tongue-in-cheek um, story. There's this wizard, apparently he can only conjure lemons, and he gets a message that he needs to go help defeat this hydra. Every year it demands nine women from the village. And so he goes, he gets, or along the way he gets this witch, and he gets the witch to come with him, and they get to the cave, the witch goes in, there's a big kaboom, the witch comes back out with an arm full of treasure. He goes in and gets more treasure and his little assistant's like, hey, how did you figure out how to defeat the Hydra? And he said, "It's um, even though I can only conjure lemons, I have access to books and knowledge of lore and I knew this truth, a witch in time saves nine. So I think that's supposed to be funny. And here is uh, Paraphernalia, the, the last page that they have. Um, Traveler, they say we have news that there's going to be a new se sector supplement. G Golems, they say, you know, um, this is a human, human image brought to life. Early Golems come from Jewish necromancers or Jewish sort of history or magical um, ideas from way back in history. They point out the college, the college of Heralds was established by Richard III, March 2nd, 1483. And so they're coming up here now past the 500th anniversary of having um, heraldry. Someone wants you to know that the, they think the A-Team, if you remember that television show from the 80s with um, uh, B.A. Baracus and Hannibal Smith and Face Murdoch. So this is a great traveler party. They've got the different backgrounds, right? We've got the big guy, we've got the who does explosives, we've got the kind of spy who can conceal his identity, we got the planner. So he's he's giving you some stat ideas on how to use these guys as a sample party. And finally, our history of swords continues with the Gladius from uh, Roman times, and they tell you a little bit about this sword. About it's really a short sword, right? Only about two feet long, two inches wide. But part of the key armament for the Roman soldiers, right? They had the um, the scutum, the pilum, and the and the gladius. Here's our rear cover, just telling you can get the back issues. And there's a little rat with a flail here at the bottom. All right, let's take a look at the artwork, and I will get out of the way so you guys can see that better. This I think is Fox because it's just the F. Um, it's like a little Smurf who has chopped off a head. And what it reminds me of, there is a Rao Partha figure of a ghoul that is very similar to this Smurf. It's holding a head in one hand and a little sword in the other. So I don't know if that's the inspiration. I think it is. 
Um, and then we have this lady down here, this lady fighter who's wearing basically no armor. Uh, Tim Pollard has a drawing that was there in the article about um, having a war, putting your, letting your players participate in a war level battle. And here's some stuff from Hudson Shaw, very distinctive, very sort of animated uh, theme or, or flair to his drawing. We've got these Donald Duck looking figures here and then a couple of robots. And I just think, again, love Hudson Shaw's artwork. Uh, and here's the Donald Duck figure who's got the tiger by the tail. And uh, these are not him. I think maybe these are also Pollard's drawings of a couple of uh, warriors. The bottom one is from the RuneQuest. Well, maybe they're both from the RuneQuest adventure, but definitely the bottom one, is that's the half troll, half ogre from the RuneQuest adventure. Here is a pirate ship of some sort, right? For your RuneQuest guy who's gonna be the Errol Flynn type pirate in his early days. And a really quick drawing by Megan, whoever that is. Um, that went with the fantasy fiction. And that is it for our look at Miser's Horde number seven, the next to last one in this UK fanzine from the early to mid 80s. Hope you all enjoyed today's video. Hope you like our series and I hope that you are subscribed. Uh, if you have friends who might like our content, please send them our way. We'd be glad to have more subscribers. We are past the 500 mark and on our way to 1,000, which seems to be kind of a magical number in the world of, uh, in the world of YouTube. Uh, again, have a great weekend. And until next time, my friends, keep rolling 20s.